Hey guys, welcome back to another edition of Baseball Dads Podcast. And on this episode, I'm pretty pumped because um, we have a guy named Chris Giselle as our guest today. And uh, Chris has an incredible baseball resume that we'll talk about. But more importantly, I'm kind of a fan of his. Um, I follow what he does on social media. He's got an incredible way of talking about the game, talking about the, the state of the game, and educating young pitchers. So he is a... He's a, he's a pitcher that's, that's been there and been on the elite level, but uh, what I really respect about him is now he's taken, taken that passion and really dedicated himself to working with kids, working with kids in, in the right way, keeping things in perspective, teaching, obviously, the X's and O's in the game. But it's, it, it's just a very cool way he does. He runs a program called BaseballDudes.com. You can check it out there. But it's just a very – uh, a very positive and encouraging thing, and it's something I've really ad- admired and I've watched for a little while. So, Chris, thanks for making the time today, and uh, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for thanks for having me. I'm um, looking forward to talking more about all this good stuff. Yeah, so give, let's give us the the two minute rundown. Tell us uh, about your career, baseball background, all that kind of stuff. Uh, well, graduated at a local high school here in Vancouver, Washington in 96, uh, got drafted that year, went on to play, uh, very fortunate to do it for 14 years uh, from there, was interviewing for some local scouting positions and ended up getting a minor league coaching job with the Angels, did that for a few years, and now uh, very fortunate to get to work with local families here, and uh, I think we're in year four of that now. We're about to start our fourth year of, of our player development program. So it's we're very fortunate. Um, couldn't really ask for anything more. You know, I still get to be involved in the game. Um, I still get to throw the baseball every day and play yeah. catch. <laughs> and, you know, that's uh, there are different phases to our programs. You know, for most of the year, we're inside working with kids. Other part, we, we get to go outside for a couple months. Um, bottom line, it comes down to the kids, and that's that's what it's all about. You know, whether it's helping the kids or helping their parents work through things, or what I, what I'm really enjoying is also uh, working with our local coaches and helping them learn different ways, find better ways of of helping their kids too. Yeah, so you know, we were talking a little bit before we hit record. Um, we're talking about some of the things that are going on in the game. So uh, I'm always, I'm always curious to get someone's opinion who's kind of been up and down through the game. You know that you, you you know you've been to the highest level. You know what it takes to to get there. Um, and what are your, what are you seeing as, as things that are maybe that are going on in the game that you think we could be better at? Well, obviously being a former pitcher. Um, and, I, and a majority, probably 95% of the kids I work with and the families are families of pitchers. Um, so pay close attention to that. Um, it's, you know, again, I played for 14 years. I, you know, over that time, well over probably 1,500 innings pitched um, as a starter for most of it. Went back and forth, starting, relieving, Um and just just understanding the arm and, and what it takes and what it feels like, you know, what it feels like to go out there and throw 100 pitches and, you know, how the body feels the next day and on day two and day three and day four. Um, and then longevity, you know, what what does it take for, for a pitcher to be strong on day one of the season and then on the last game of the season to, to still be just as strong? Um, I think those are – those are a lot of things that I see that when it comes to our youth pitchers and kind of the way the game is played now, um, you know, with it not really being a, a season of 40 to 60 games spread out over months, but it being more of, you know, bombarding or an overload of games on one weekend and then a couple weeks off and then another overload of games. So kind of what that does to the arm and when there's, kind of a lack of preparation in between, you know, and I, we all know anybody who pays attention to the youth world um, knows that injuries have skyrocketed. So, right. yep. you know, a, a, a huge question is why, you know, what's going on and all this started around the year 2000, which, and again, I'm not, I don't 
bash or anything tournament baseball, but kind of the way things are done, um, you know, it's just it's not good for the arms. And around that same time is when we started seeing arms breaking. And there's also other factors, you know, older players, you know, we just we train different now, we throw so much harder and you know, it's the body is only meant to do so much. And I think when you kind of reach reach those extraordinary levels, um of the output on the arm that things are going to break. That's just anybody who's doing anything to max effort over and over and over at extreme levels, something's going to happen, you know? So that's, that's also part of it. But the overload that we see on these young kids, you know, their things are slowly, slowly breaking until one day, you know, maybe three years from now, somebody's arm says, that's it. I'm done. I don't, I can't do this anymore. You know, and it's, we, we tend to think that it's, you know, he broke it on this day because of because of he he was doing this or he threw that pitch at that moment. Cold out. It was I heard, yeah. I heard it was cold out that day. <laughs> yeah, and all and all those things may factor into what the arm was, the shape it was in at that moment. But it's the years and years of stuff that happened before then. This and this is all what we're learning. You know that, you know that there's there's a kid I'm working with right now who he is a uh, junior. Yeah, he's a junior, big old tall kid, lefty, has a really good delivery. <clears throat> and I'm watching him throw, I'm like, how did this kid break? And, I mean, he's got – fundamentally, he's doing everything right in, a, in his delivery. And when I, you know, get with talking with him and, and, and dad, you know, he would, he would pitch and throw seven or eighty pitches, and then a game later that same day, he'd be playing first base. And then the next day, he's out there playing a the position. So there's – his, his arm would get overload or, or do what it needs to do, and then it would get into recovery mode, and all of a sudden, a few hours later, you know, he's cranking on it again. You know, so there's that when you're, when you're young, you're, you're, you know, you feel invincible. And as parents were ignorant to it, you know, most coaches are ignorant to it, you just don't realize what that arm is going through. When, honestly, that kid, if he threw 80 pitches at – 10 o'clock on Saturday, you know, he's done for the rest of the day after that. And the next day, you know, he, if he's going to play a position, it's very limited. Um, yeah. But that's, that's just our current culture and society and the way we're doing it. We are either oblivious to it or we don't, we don't pay attention to it or we know it and we just don't care. So there's, yeah. there's a lot of factors in it. But the way the game is played now is so different compared to when you and I were growing up, you know. We may have thrown too many pitches, but we didn't do any more throwing the rest of the day, you know. And, you know, we, the next day it was our bodies had, you know, maybe not optimal, but we had recovery time, whereas now it, there really is no recovery time. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think you made a great point about tournament baseball because I get a lot of that too. Like I'm, I'm against tournament baseball. I'm not against that. I kind of look at it like donuts. You know, like, I'm not against donuts. But I'm against eating a dozen donuts. You know, I, 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 that's it's just going to make you sick, right? It's not good for anybody. And so that I think that's, you know, everything has its place and has moderation. But there, um, you just made some great points there. Um, what advice would you give to a dad who is in that moment where he, he has to decide, I'm going to go into this world or I'm going to maybe hold my son back a little bit. That's what a lot of our dads struggle with. I probably get that question at least a few times a day in email or over the phone. So you've been there, right? Now, mm-hmm. can you turn it back and say, talk to that dad who maybe has a 9, 10, 11, 12, or 13, 14-year-old kid who i got to make a decision. Either my kid's going to go into this world or I'm going to, you know, um, mold it a little bit differently. What would you say to him? Yeah. Well, I actually just had this conversation a couple of days ago uh, with a father of a 10 year old, almost 11 year old. And what, what we see now is, is, you know, parents talk amongst parents, coaches and programs, you know, it's, they're, you know, it's almost like we're salesmen, you know? Yeah. You need to do this. If your goal is this, this is what you need to do, you know? And right. then he's being told that, if he doesn't get into it now, that a couple of years from now, so around when the kid is 12, it will probably be too late. So yeah. for me, I hear that, and again, just working with 
with how many families we do and hearing all the stuff we hear and seeing the, the kids' confidence levels when they walk into the tunnel, you know, it's – there's really – if a, a kid is going to be as good as he's going to be, you know, whether he's playing 50 games a year or 20 games a year or 80 games a year, his talent, it kind of is what it is. And if a kid plays Little League Baseball from 9 to 12, he is still going to have the same talent as a 13-year-old as he would if he played travel or tournament ball or whatever, or elite baseball, whatever you call it, from 9 to 12. You know, mm-hmm. he may he may have developed a little bit quicker, but the talent is still, that's what's in you, if that makes sense. You know, it's, a, it's almost like what you're born with. And yep. in my opinion, you're not, you're not going to be behind. You're not going to miss out. You know, it's, if a kid has talent and he has passion, he's going to work, he's going to learn, he's going to get better. You know, sure, if he's facing kids that are throwing 70 every day as opposed to 50 every day, he's going to be more prepared to hit 70. Um, but that's not saying that you take both those kids when they get to high school that one isn't going to be more prepared than the other. And I think, and I again, I'm a, I'm a believer, and I've seen it all, and I've mean, seen seen kids who became professionals that only played Little League and Babe Ruth, you know, but they still became professionals. There's there's a sense in, in our world now that if you don't go that so-called elite route, that you're just, your talent won't pan out. And I, again, for me and all the kids I work with, and it's, I don't necessarily believe that. I've seen too many kids that are great high school players that didn't, you know, go to showcases or, you know, spend thousands of dollars playing in a, in a elite program. Right. It, 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 and it's tough, right? Cause it's, I almost feel like sometimes we've shifted the definition of what making it is, you know, and like where I think we grew up and making it was college or professional or, or beyond that. And it, I almost feel like making it now is, are you on that right team yeah. that goes on the best trips and, does the right thing. And it, you know, it almost feels like it's shifted where they've brought the major league kind of experience or the professional college experience down to that level. Do you see, do you feel that a little bit? Yeah. And I, and I think a lot of it has to do with, with youth baseball um, being ran more like a business now. So yep. with that business becomes higher fees, you know, tournaments are now charging more fees. Um, you know, you get <clears throat> two to three different uniforms. Um, you know, there, there's, there's all this stuff. I mean, you, you even saw that article in the yeah. Times where, you know, kids are being flown, you know, from out of state into, into play. So it's, it's way more of, of a, of a business now. And, you know, which program is the, you know, so-called elite program, um, you know, it's it's definitely different in that sense. You know, and it's like you have you have half the world that can't afford that, you know, or they don't necessarily believe in it, and then the other half that looks, you know, almost down on that other half, you know, or that, you know, we're doing this, so you know, we're guaranteed, you know, to to be better. Um, I mean, there's really no guarantee in any of this. Um, but you know, it, it's definitely shifted, and again, it's. But, but, and it's not for everybody. Some families really enjoy the travel. They really, really enjoy it. You know, that's their family time. And there, you can't knock that. You can't knock that at all. And then there's some families that will dive into that world. And then the next world, they'll, will realize that that was just too much and they'll back out. And, you know, again, you have to, it's a, it's a live and learn thing. And, you know, obviously we try to help families learn maybe before from what other people have experienced. You know, I always encourage families like, hey, before you make this decision, go find families that have been doing it. And don't just talk to the families that had the really talented kids that coaches love and the coaches played every inning. Find the families that for some reason left, you know, that program. Yeah. You know, find, you know, pick their, yeah, pick their brains and, you know, make your decision based off of that. You know, it's, you know, the, the 
the term drink the Kool-Aid. You know, be careful of following that, that, you know, that small group that everybody loves the taste of that Kool-Aid. You know, find the people that have started turning it away. No why. Yeah. I find out the whys. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, it's I, tough, I, man. It, it's, it's, it's really tough. It's very tough. It, 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 it's also very tough. I, um, a question I get a lot from parents is, what do you do with a kid who just, you know, lives, sleeps, you know, breathes baseball um, and just wants to play it all the time? And I say, yeah. <clears throat> you know, it's a tough situation. You're like, wow, you want to encourage this enthusiasm, right? But, you know, my kids are enthusiastic about cupcakes and Swedish fish and Cheez-Its and M&Ms. And if I let them decide – how much is that to eat? They would eat it all. They wouldn't eat anything else, right? Just like we were, you know, we were kids. We do the same thing. And I, I often worry about the even the families that do love travel. I often feel that sometimes it, it puts that pressure on the kid now that this is where the family's connecting and they love the travel. And if they decide, hey, I don't want to play baseball anymore, does that is it does it now affect the family? You know, does that now you know is there an inherent pressure there? To, to keep that up because it is what is a good thing for the family, you know, a fun time for the family. I, 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 just, I worry about that sometimes. Um, yeah. I want to the the over, about, oh, go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. I was going to say the, the overuse, you know, the, the burnout piece is it's real. Um, and, I mean, the yeah. same thing comes with there will be families that want to start working on the pitching in November. And I'm like, Let's slow down before we start yeah. scheduling all these these training sessions. When is when is his season going to start? How long is his next season going to go? You know, if we start working out now in November, you know, we could be practicing pitching for five months before he ever gets into a game, and that's not good for anybody. You know, that's not good for him mentally. He'll start getting bored. That's not good for his body. Um, you know, he's kind of – he's – He's getting up to max maybe a little bit too soon, and then come, you know, the middle of the summertime, that burnout will hit him. That burnout will yeah. hit him physically and mentally. And then even you guys as parents, you know, that 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 mental burnout will will hit. I mean, there there was a mom I was talking with a couple of years ago who's who's sitting with me in what was it May or June and. You can tell she's, you know, she's drained, and we start talking, and, you know, they, this, whatever team she was on, it was literally seven days a week, and I'm just like, yeah. she, you know, it's a game, you know, it's, you guys, you're going to need to make some adjustments as a family after this season's over, because you, you shouldn't feel like this about baseball, you shouldn't feel like yeah. it's a, it's a job. Yeah, your kid, your kid's not even a teenager yet. Yeah, it's it, uh, you know, yeah, I, it's. I, I have, I, I think it, it's the hardest thing to do between you know, like, is, is trying to figure out where do you, you know, where do you stop, you know, what what's what's a healthy dose, I guess, you know, like what's, yeah. what's a healthy yeah. dose where it doesn't get to be too much. I, I wish I wish there was some kind of a formula we could share, you know, that could say, hey, this is happening, you know. But the, the signs of burnout and the signs of even fatigue and the early signs of injury um, usually are there. And, they, and uh, I've, I've, I, don't know how, I don't know how to use that. I've usually struggled in helping parents pick them up early enough, you know, to, to make a difference. Um, but once it, once it kind of hits, then parents can, point, you know, can pinpoint back and say, oh, that's where, yeah, now looking back, that's where it probably started to fall apart a little bit, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, you know, it, be, being in the world that I'm in, where we don't, I don't have teams. You know, we don't have, you know, we don't travel around our area playing games. So the families that we work with are, you know, they come to us for help yeah. on whether whatever whatever that scale is. And you you will you will see it. You know, you will you will see them wanting to start so soon, and then. We're still seeing seeing you, you know, in a in a month where I understand why there's why there's burnout. Um, yeah. I want to go back real quick to what you said about 
the kid that has passion and the kid that that loves it and he he wants he want he eats and breathes sleeps and breathes baseball those are those are coaches dreams because you know that when they're away from you they're doing something to get better and right. to be honest you have to have that to be to be extraordinary in this game that's a piece that you have to have you know very rarely will you see someone who has unbelievable god-given talent and they never have to work at it, and they just become a big leaguer. They, they, it's happened. It's happened. Don't get me wrong. There's guys I played with that it was like they didn't pick up a bat until spring training, and they ended up playing the big leagues. But it was like John Cruck. Is, you ever hear John John Cruck? Uh, they asked yeah. him what he did during the season, and he said, yeah, "Fuck, yeah. play cards." And they go, "What did you do during the off season?" He says, I, "We drink beer and play cards." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that that's you know that's one in a billion. You know that <clears throat> that has that ability. Um, so you, so you, you know, you have to have that that love for it and the talent to to be great. And on the flip side, how many times have we seen or heard stories of kids in you know whatever the sport is, who that they end up getting a college scholarship and all of a sudden they say they tell mom and dad that I don't I don't want to go. You know, I, I'm done. I'm done playing. I, I'm tired. You know, and that's like that's a real issue too. Um, I, it's almost like sometimes you have to force those kids to, hey, you know, you have to you have to be a salesman and help them understand, like, hey, we just need to slow down a little bit. You know, in your book, you talk about what the ultimate goal is. Um, you know, if the ultimate goal is to be this, you know, let's. Let's talk about what we need to do to get ready for that. And part of that is giving our those little things in our body a rest, you know. And while we're having that rest, we do other things to prepare. Right. Um, so it's it's almost you have to sell the kid on what his goal is. You have to sell him on how do we how do we achieve that goal. Um, and then that that comes from selling the parents on it too, which is which is more than half the battle. Yeah, we had a guest on, on a podcast we just did recently, Kevin Dewey, who runs Sports Ad Hub. He had a great um something that woke me up where he said, I want my kids to miss the sport a little bit. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And the minute he said that, like my dad used to like mow the lawns a little league and stuff like that. And I can remember like the build up to opening day. You know, in the town opening day, and I, and I, I just you know, like as the spring starts to turn, you, you smell the grass, and like you really can't wait to get back out there, you know, and 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 play the game. And I just, I had never thought of that, you know, it, in in this new age that we're in, is that do we ever give kids that that feeling of man, baseball's going to start soon, you know, it's awesome, you know, and I felt that every year of my life until you know growing up, you know, every year of playing youth baseball, you know, and, and I, I, I think it's an important thing, you know, for those kids to miss that a little bit. I see that more with the little, little league kids I work with than I do with um, the kids that are full-blown playing 60, 70 games a year. I see more of that excitement from those kids. Yeah. And, and it's, again, it's – you. A coach has done a great job. Parents have done a great job if when the season is over, the kids are excited for to play next season. Right. You know, it's that's that's our that's our one goal is the kids to get better, for them to keep loving the game and for them to, to you know, to keep that excitement for for the next time. Yeah. Yeah. Um well, let's switch gears here. You have a great blog post that I want to direct people to that uh, I think anybody who's pitching a baseball should read and it's, it's at baseballdudes.com slash save dash our arms slash where you scroll on the main page and it's in the navigation here. You have this this list of things here that um it, it's just a great guide. You know, it's like I, I don't know that I've ever seen it and we see a lot of stuff um that is just as clear and concise as this. Um so I'm pretty sure I, I know your intentions behind it, but Let's, let's talk a little bit about some of your recommendations here. What do you think are the big ones um, that a pitcher, you know, a father who's guiding that pitcher needs to be aware of? 
Well, if I put it on that page, it's I don't have it in front of me, but if I if I put it on that page, there's obviously I think it's a big one. Um, yeah. And as as I've been going through this, and I I just I put that page up maybe a, a year ago, um, and you know we have pitch count you know guidelines on there, and you know to be honest, what the numbers you see on that chart that I put together, they are super conservative, you know and yep. There's so many variables that go into, you know, kind of deciding how many pitches can I give this kid today, you know, going back to what he's done recently, you know, what's our plan for the future. You know, there, there's so many variables, but that's just kind of like a guideline, mainly for yeah. for coaches who just don't have the experience, you know. So yeah. um, I think one of the one of the biggest ones, and I'm and I've really kind of figure out the importance of it was what I referred to a few minutes ago about when a, when a kid pitches a, a, a high number of pitches, how to handle that arm after that. And, yeah. set, you know, shutting that kid down for the rest of the day is so important. But, you know, we see a kid that will throw 80 pitches and then gets stuck out in center field. You know, and all yep. of a sudden an hour later or 45 minutes later, a half hour later, after that kid's kind of arm has gone to gone into you know recovery mode, he has to crank loose and let one rip to the infield, which is right. awful, yeah. awful for the arm. Um, yeah. And this happens all the time. It happens. It's crazy how much it happens that that kid gets taken, gets put from the mound to a position. You know, if he if he threw an inning or two and and the pitch count was low, we're fine. You know, it's not a big deal, but when yeah. you get up to those high high pitch count numbers, and especially when you have kids who possess, you know, fast arm, you know, they they have ability to throw hard. You know, it's just it's even more strain um, that that is being put on the arm. So for me, for me, that's that's a biggie. Um, another biggie for me is when you find programs or teams that only play in tournaments and they don't have games in between. Um, you know, and say they have a tournament Fourth of July weekend, and then they don't play another one until two weeks, yeah. two weekends later. Yeah. And in between, in between, there's very few practices. There's yeah. limited to no bullpen throwings. There's no practice games, or there's no games. So there, there's nothing that's keeping these these arms conditioned for whatever they they've whatever they threw and whatever they want to throw. So, yeah. and being a pitcher long, you know, all it takes is three to four, maybe five days of little to no throwing where you're, you start to lose stamina, you lose arm strength. Everything kind of yeah. starts going south quick. Yeah. And, you know, we, I mean, we've gone so far as to when we have kids come in, you know, that we will throw simulated games. You know, they'll throw a bullpen, They'll get up there and throw 15 batters. I was going to ask you that. On the mound, yeah. you know, or 15 pitches. I'll have the other, you know, the, his partner will hop up there and he'll throw his 15 pitches. And we'll go back and forth and do, you know, maybe 45 to 60, you know, pitches worth of innings, um, if that makes sense. Just to, just to keep his arm, their arms ready for the next weekend. Um, yeah. Which that that's just it that. isn't it isn't it isn't done. It's almost like ignored. Um, so for me, that that's a big. What were you going to say? Well, I I, I, had, I had to say how do I you know my kids pitching in this tournament and this now is the time a lot of this stuff comes up, right? That mm-hmm. well, he pitched in a tournament in September. His next one was not until October. How do I keep him fresh for a month? Yeah. Uh, like honestly, I, I I would say keep it. You know, pretend like you're playing. Yeah. You know, just throw your you know, simulated throw, games. Yeah, throw some simulated games, and at least you have the ability to set the pitch count, so you, at least you know that. Um, and you could set the intervals and the rest between sets, and you could work on some conditioning so it's not all game intensity type pitches. But that was kind of my advice, right? It, it used to be real easy, right? You play a, a high school season, you play a legion season, and then maybe you play in the fall. And, and if, if you played in the fall, it was every weekend, right? So there was, it, there was some rhythm to it. And, yeah, how do you keep an arm fresh for a month or three weeks, you know? Um, yeah. and, and remember that it's, it's 
I, I worry that not only are they not pitching, but they don't. They get thrown right into high pressure <laughs> situations when they do come back. You know, or you know, you say high pressure, and because all these tournaments are they're they're treated like it's a World Series, right? So you know, we we look at these World Series and we see, you know, Wade Davis, a closer, going in there throwing. 50-something pitches. Um, yeah. That's the World Series. They, you know, they right. talked about once a year. Season, yeah, once he, a year. During the season, he, he, he would do that. He would never throw more than one inning. Um, right. That's just kind of how closers are handled these days. But, you know, that's that's how the Cubs handled it in the World Series. You know, but here in youth baseball, we see every single tournament treated like it's the World Series. And then yeah. you ha- so you see kids being – pushed to numbers that they're not ready for. You see them being, you know, pushed to throw multiple times what they should never be doing in the first place. And it's it's all for one thing. It's for, you know, that glory of, you know, to stand up there at the end and, you know, be able to take a picture with one finger in the air. So, you know, it's it's interesting to me, too. That's a lot. I'm sorry. Go ahead. ahead. (laughs) Sorry. Uh, I, I... you know, when you think about those situations that um, adults are put in, in a World Series or something where everything is kind of on the line, you played a lot of baseball. And as a pitcher, right, you've watched a lot of baseball. You know, right? you're, you're, you know, not like you're playing the field every day. You've had the opportunity to observe a lot of baseball, probably more than anyone maybe listening to this podcast would have ever played. Most games – are kind of won or lost, right? Like, mm-hmm. you know, with the, the rule of 54, right, that you're going to lose 54, win 54, there's not much you could do with those, right? It's the ones, it's the 54 in the middle that mm-hmm. makes a difference. And so I've always felt that the manager in the, in the, in the long baseball season, even a high school season, 25, 30 games, the manager or the co-head coach doesn't really come into play much in most games. It's not like basketball and football, right? Like, there's yeah, you can make a pitching change, you can you can steal, hit and run, but I mean, it's, it doesn't come down to a lot of you know. Some game, not every game has a pressure filled situation built into it, and so I feel that when you when you watch regular season baseball, it just happens, right? But in the playoffs, the managers almost become like these characters, mm-hmm. right? Where it is about matchups and. Yeah. You know, we see, like, right, Girardi didn't challenge, uh, um, what was it, hit by pitch, or, or was it catch, whatever it was, right? And and he probably would have lost his job if they didn't win that series. Yeah. You know, and, so, and I almost feel like this tournament baseball creates an environment for these coaches where they're almost part of, they're, they're more part of the game than a regular season yeah. where most games kind of just play out. What do you think of that? Well, Watching, watching the playoffs, and I mean, I, I love it. It's it's high. It's the best baseball in the world. You know, it's the best teams, the best players. You see, I mean, these post game interviews that we're seeing. I mean, the the questions the reporters are asking, they pick apart every single decision, yeah. every yeah. decision that's made. And when it comes down to it, and when I was playing, and when I would see, you know, hear about managers getting fired and this and that, the coaches very often become the scapegoat in those situations. You know, yeah. the the team the team failed because of the the coach's decisions. Whereas if that very, you know, if one or two key players on that team would have produced more frequently or more consistently, we, we, this discussion wouldn't be happening. Um, so you you see that you see that in these MLB playoffs. And if the players, if they, if they go out there and they do what they're capable of, you know, the, he's not having to answer those questions. You know, a reviewable call, that, that is what it is. I mean, that's talk about change in the game. Um, but it's, as, as players, you get to that level, you know, it's, you, 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 you go out there and do your job. And it seems that more often than not, it's, when they're failing, it's because of the hitting coach's lack of approach or because of that approach or the manager's 
you know, choice in putting not bringing Wade Davis in or bringing him in. You know, I I honestly, when I heard what, you know, Madden was saying about Wade Davis, you know, because of he didn't bring him in because he was only available for one inning that day, you know, I'm like, that's, I'm thinking, like, here we are at the most important time of the year, and, you know, we're one of the best managers in the world is still conscious of one of his star pitchers' arm health. Yeah. You know, whereas yeah. Is, is in the whole world out there, our youth world, very rarely, and it, it, it does happen, but very rarely is that the first thing that's on a coach's mind, you know, is yeah. – when did when did, who do I have available today? Who can pitch? Who can't pitch? Right? And if they can pitch, how many can I give them because of what they've been doing? You know, just yeah. that doesn't. It's tough. I mean, if you if you were going to play these games, you know, like they're big league games, then treat them like big leaguer, like you would treat big leaguers, and you wouldn't go up yeah. and throw these kids the way you you know the way you're throwing. Big leaguers are never going to be used like that. You will never see. A professional arm throw eighty pitches in one day, and then come back the very next day and right. pitch in two different games. It's just, it's just not going to happen. But well, it, and the other reason too is because that guy's agent would be yeah. You know, yeah. Forget about yeah, the, the agent would be blown up front. So whether they're protecting them for the whatever reason they're protecting them for, there's mm-hmm. someone there protecting them. You know, money or whatever the reason, but there is someone there protecting them. Yeah. It's going to come down to the, to the, you know, the health of the player, you know, and longevity yeah. and what, you know, where we want, you know, this kid to be able to play this game for a long time. You know, this yeah. this day right now is, you know, he's not going to remember it. He's not going to remember whether this game is won or lost. You know, when he, when he's a higher, you know, in his late years in high school, he's not going to remember these youth days. He's not going right. to. Yeah. Well, let's. Um, I want to direct people to uh, to your site, baseballdudes.com, and um, and I want to. I just. I want to. I want to. In a minute, I'll ask you for some final words of wisdom. Um, but check out what Chris does, and here's for a few reasons why. I again, I started as a fan of his. Um, I, I I don't. I think we met over just Facebook messaging group. It's the first time we talked, and um, but. I, just from the, what what he's posted is that number one, he's a family man first, so I respect that. I, I, I you know you could just tell by the way he 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 his posts and what his does and where his tent is. So I, he's a guy that you want to follow in that respect, just because I think he's a great example as a parent um, and as a dad and husband and leader. So I, I really respect that. And his views on the game are just are great. They're just great. And um. I don't follow many many people. Um, I tend not to be such a social media guy, but he's one of the guys that I follow, and I really enjoy reading what he puts out because I think there's this theme through it that he, he like I said, he's a family guy. He cares, so he cares about other people's kids, um, probably the same way he cares about his own kids, uh, as I feel. And we need these guys in baseball. We need guys like this, especially guys who've had the success um, that he's had in his career. Um, First, thank you for that. Thank you for, for, for being a great leader and for being a, a voice in, in baseball that I think is needed. Um, what, so go to baseballdudes.com, check them out, and there's links on there. There's all the things we talked about, the CD arm, and where you can follow him on social and stuff like that. Um, Chris, what final words of wisdom do you have for those who are listening? You know, for, for me, one that you, you said being a family man, and I have three children myself, um, and again, working with with the families I do, the relationship that we have with our kids is that's as parents that's that's our treasure. You know, that's when it comes down to it. Bottom line, that's hopefully for everybody that that's what matters most. And I urge everybody to make sure that that we're always aware of that and that our kids are kids. And that our families are family, and don't ever, don't ever let sports and you know a kid's performance out there on the field or the court, um, you know their 
maybe their work ethic. You know, we're not really happy with their work ethic, but we got to understand that our relationship with our kids is is what matters most. And don't ever let sports and a kid's athletic ability um, or their performance get in the way of of that. I, I've seen. I've seen it happen too many times, which hasn't been many, but it's still too many. I've seen too many times where a relationship is fractured um, over sports, and that for me is one of the toughest things to see. You know, again, just knowing I was very fortunate to get to play the game as long as I did. I, I understand that doesn't happen for many, but that's not. It, it doesn't happen for everybody. You know, and it's. We all need to understand that, and whether we're teaching the game or we're watching it, um, we can never forget how hard the game is and that we're still people and that kid is still a person, and when it comes down to it, that win or that loss, it, it's just it's not the end, whether we're great or whether we're not so great. It's just not the end. It isn't. Um, so understand that those relationships are the most important thing. Yeah, I mean, that's the message that's, uh, I can't say it any better. Um, that's really why we're do that podcast. So, um, I think that's the perfect place to, to put this one on the runway. So, um, guys, check out baseballdudes.com. Follow Chris on social. Um, I think you really enjoy everything that he does. So, Chris, thanks so much for being on today. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, it's been my pleasure. I appreciate the opportunity to share.